Well, thank, thank you very much, Edward, for the very, very kind introduction, and, and, and it has been so great spending time with, with Ed and Alyssa and their, their wonderful, wonderful family. It's so great to be with so many dear friends here this morning. I'd like to begin by just remembering those who were murdered in San Bernardino yesterday. And I would ask if we could observe a moment of silence in their honor. At this point, the details of what happened in San Bernardino are still unclear. But our prayers are with the families of those who were murdered, of those who were shot. And all of us are deeply concerned that this is yet another manifestation of terrorism, radical Islamic terrorism here at home. Coming on the wake of the terror attack in Paris, this horrific murder underscores that we are at a time of war. Whether or not the current administration realizes it or is willing to acknowledge it, our enemies are at war with us. And I believe this nation needs a wartime president to defend it. In recent weeks, President Obama traveled abroad to explain that he doesn't believe in American leadership, that he doesn't believe in America winning, quote, I don't have time for that. You know, I've got to say, FDR and JFK and Ronald Reagan were spinning in their graves to hear an American president say he doesn't believe in American leadership or America winning. I, I'll tell you, when it comes to radical Islamic terrorism, I think our strategy to borrow a page from Ronald Reagan in the Cold War should be very simple. We win, they lose. And there are three things the next president should do to keep this nation safe. The first is speak the truth. The truth has power. And at this point, the politically correct double streak speak that comes from the Obama administration has gone beyond the point of ridiculous. When the president stands up and says the Islamic State isn't Islamic. <laughs> That's just nutty. <laughs> we need a president who will call the enemy by its name, radical Islamic terrorism, and we will defeat it. You know, there's a power to speaking the truth back when Israel was facing daily rocket fire with Hamas. I joined with New York Democrat Kirsten Gillibrand in introducing a resolution condemning Hamas's use of human shields as a war crime. That resolution passed both houses of Congress unanimously as we came together to speak the truth. Likewise, Following the terrorist attack that occurred in Fort Hood over five years ago, the Obama administration refused to speak the truth, refused to acknowledge that Nadal Hassan, who had communicated with Anwar al awlaki a known radical cleric who had asked about the permissibility of waging jihad against his fellow servicemen, who in walking through Fort Hood murdering 14 innocent souls, yelled out, Aluha Akbar, as he committed that act of terrorism, the Obama administration inexplicably characterized that instead as workplace violence. One of the things I'm most proud about in my tenure in the Senate 
is that I introduced the legislation to mandate that the Purple Heart be awarded to those soldiers who were murdered. The Obama Pentagon fought tooth and nail against that legislation, yet I'm proud to say on the Senate Armed Services Committee I was able to earn the support of Republicans and Democrats. We passed it into law in December and in April. I was at the ceremony where those Purple Hearts were awarded, and to each of the family members I simply shook their hands, looked them in the eyes, and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it took five years to acknowledge the sacrifice of your loved one. You know, when it comes to speaking the truth, this administration does precisely the opposite. We have a president right now who at times operates as an apologist for radical Islamic terrorists. Now, I don't use that word lightly. The word apologist has a very specific meaning. There's someone that gives a rationalization, a justification for the conduct. I was at the last national prayer breakfast. You'll recall the day before ISIS had lit a Jordanian pilot on fire. The king of Jordan, who was supposed to attend the prayer breakfast, had to fly back to Jordan. And President Obama gave a speech in which he said, yes, ISIS commits terrorist attack. But so do Christians and so do Jews. And he then invoked the Crusades and the Inquisition. Now, the last I checked, those ended about 900 years ago. And I don't think it's asking too much for the President of the United States to stay in the current millennium. And the argument, this is just like the Crusades and the Inquisition, is exactly the argument that ISIS and the terrorists use. And it is not beneficial, nor is it beneficial, when the Secretary of State, John Kerry, <laughs> you know him well, <laughs> suggests some months ago that Israel could become an apartheid state. Or when the Secretary of State, John Kerry, also says that the terrorist attack against Charlie Hebdo was understandable, the United States of America should not be trying to rationalize radical Islamic terrorists. I'll tell you, when John Kerry was nominated, only three senators voted against his confirmation. Never have I been prouder to have been in that gang of three. And when Kerry ca called Israel an apartheid state, I went to the Senate floor and called for Kerry's resignation. And when he. <laughs> and I would note that we need more senators, both Republicans and Democrats, that likewise call for accountability when the Secretary of State uses language that undermines the safety and security of our allies. And that's the second thing we need to do, is we need to stand by our allies. You know, all of us knew early in the Obama administration there were warning signs when in the opening weeks, the President sent back to the United Kingdom the bust of Winston Churchill. That was just a foreshadowing of things to come, and after seven years, we have not seen an administration more antagonistic and hostile to the nation of Israel in the entire history of this country. If I'd have suggested to you six years ago that the elected Prime Minister of Israel would come to America, would address a joint session of Congress, and he would be boycotted by the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, and every member of the Cabinet, our friends in the media would have dismissed that as crazy conspiracy talk. That would never happen. I'll tell you, on the eve of that speech, I organized a panel discussion with Elie Wiesel 
to discuss the threat of the Iranian nuclear deal. Elie Wiesel wanted that to be a bipartisan discussion. So I invited one Democrat after another Democrat after another Democrat after another Democrat. We invited roughly a dozen Democrats, and not a single Democrat was willing to stand on a stage with Elie Wiesel and discuss the Iranian nuclear deal. I will tell you, it was truly humbling and powerful to, 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 to be on that stage with a man who has seen the face of evil and can speak truth with a moral gravity that when Elie Wiesel said as he did that never again must mean never again and the one threat of that happening is a nuclear Iran. We need a president who will stand unapologetically with the nation of Israel. When Hamas murdered three Israeli teenagers, I joined with New Jersey Democrat Bob Menendez to introduce legislation providing a $5 million reward for information leading to the capture of the terrorist who had kidnapped and murdered Naftali Frankel, one of the three. Naftali was a dual Israeli U.S. citizen. That legislation passed the Senate unanimously. Thankfully, they captured the terrorist before the House could take it up. Just in the past couple of weeks, I put together a bipartisan coalition of some 30 senators to write to the EU to oppose their plan to require labeling on products coming out of Israel. And I have pledged that if I'm elected president on the very first day in office, we will begin the process of moving the American Embassy to Jerusalem, the once and eternal capital of Israel. And let me tell you now, as we see the global BDS movement unfortunately get more and more momentum behind it in a Cruz administration, any university that supports the BDS movement will find its federal funds stripped away. And the third thing we need is we need to defeat our enemies. Not to weaken them, not to degrade them, but to defeat them. Two years ago, the nation of Iran named as their ambassador to the United Nations, Hamid Aboudalabi, a known terrorist who participated in holding Americans hostage. Everyone in this town wrung their hands. They said, this is terrible. There's nothing we can do. I introduced legislation barring Abu Dhabi and other known terrorists from coming to America. It passed the Senate 100 to nothing. It passed the House 435 to nothing, and President Obama signed it into law. Part of defeating our enemies is understanding who they are. And that means not going down the misguided foreign policy of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and, unfortunately, too many Republicans in this town. In 2009, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama led the effort to topple the government in Libya. The consequence of that, Libya has been handed over to radical Islamic terrorists fighting in a war zone. Shortly thereafter, the Obama administration led the effort to topple Mubarak in Egypt. The consequence of that, the Muslim Brotherhood, a terrorist organization, became the government in Egypt. And now we see the Obama administration, with the support of politicians in both parties, trying to topple the government in Syria with no plan for what will replace it. 
If we are to defeat our enemies, we need to be clear-eyed. That toppling a government and allowing radical Islamic terrorists to take over a nation is not benefiting our national security interests. Putting ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the Muslim Brotherhood in charge of yet another state in the Middle East is not benefiting our national security. Instead, we need a president who focuses clearly and says we will utterly destroy ISIS. who makes abundantly clear to any militant on the face of the earth, if you go and join ISIS, if you wage jihad against the United States of America, you are signing your death warrant. And then finally, we have the Iranian nuclear deal. If I am elected president, I have pledged on the very first day in office to rip to shreds this catastrophic Iranian nuclear deal. You know, at some of these Republican debates, there have been other Republican candidates for president who have said, gosh, that's not a very sophisticated approach. You don't understand. We need to wait and see if we can trust the Iranians. Well, let me tell you what. I do trust the Iranians. When the Ayatollah Khamenei burns American and Israeli flags and says death to America, I trust him that he means it. And I believe in peace through strength. We are facing a moment like Munich in 1938. And President Obama, like Chamberlain, has come back from Tehran promising peace in our time. Yet history has not been kind to those who have facilitated the gathering storm of homicidal maniacs who tell us they want to kill us. The next president needs to have the fortitude to say to the Ayatollah Khamenei in no uncertain terms, either you will stop your nuclear weapons program or we will stop it for you. And I want to give a word of hope and encouragement on all of this. I've said many times, this election, this moment in time, is eerily similar to the late 1970s. The parallels between Barack Obama and Jimmy Carter are uncanny. The same failed economic policies, the same misery, stagnation, and malaise, the same feckless and naive foreign policy. In fact, the exact same countries, Russia and Iran, openly laughing at and mocking the President of the United States. I believe this next election, 2016, is going to be an election like 1980, that we are going to win by painting in bold colors and not pale pastels. The manifest failures of the Carter administration set the stage for the Reagan revolution, which came from millions of Americans across this country. It was a grassroots movement. It didn't come from Washington. Washington despised Reagan. It came from the American people, and it transformed this country. And the word of optimism I will give you is the same thing is happening all over this country. People are waking up incredibly. And when it comes to foreign policy, the difference a strong president can make is underscored by the simple fact that this very same nation, the nation of Iran, released our hostages the day 
Ronald Reagan was sworn into office. And with that, Matt, happy to answer or dodge any question you like. First of all, Senator, thank you. On behalf of the Republican Jewish Coalition, This is great. I've never gotten a standing ovation before. Um, I've got a couple questions. We have been collecting questions over the last uh, couple weeks, and I've curated a bunch of them, and I know you've touched on a bunch of your remarks. But uh, one of the things that comes up, and my apologies in advance uh, for this comparison, but a number of people have, have uh, asked that uh, much has been made of, of Barack Obama coming into office uh, as a first-term senator with no foreign policy experience. How do you respond to those who raise the same concerns about you? Well, I'll say two things. When the media asks, gosh, aren't you like Barack Obama? <laughs> My reaction to reporters is, I thought you thought that was a good thing. <laughs> Last I checked, he won two presidential elections. And listen, Barack Obama is not a bad president because he was a senator. Barack Obama is a bad president because he's an unmitigated socialist who won't stand up and defend the United States of America. <laughs> but there's a broader point in this. If you look in the last 50 years, and at the two moments that had the greatest impacts on human liberty, I would suggest it was in 1980, the election of Ronald Reagan, and in 2008, the election of Barack Obama, the first in a very positive way, the second in a very negative way. Now, they both shared something in common. Both Reagan and Obama believed profoundly in their principles. They had the courage to fight for them. When Barack Obama said he wanted to fundamentally transform this country, he meant it. And the damage that has been done in the last seven years is enormous, and I believe the only way to undo the damage is as Republicans, we need to nominate a candidate for president as committed to conservative principles as Barack Obama is to liberal principles. So this, this dovetails into the, the next question, which is how would you convince uh, staunchly pro-choice voters who love uh, your views on security on an Israel that they can still be pro-choice and vote for you? Well, you know, that's a question that comes up a lot, and the, and the simple reality is to win. Every one of us wants to win. At this point, desperately, and it's not just a question of our team winning, it's a question of saving this country. I believe the stakes have never been higher than they are right now that we are at the edge of a precipice, we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids, the safety and security of this country is hanging in the balance. And if we continue another four or eight more years down this road, we will lose this country. So we should all look with a stone cold seriousness at how we win. Now in Washington, there are political consultants who tell us over and over and over again, the way you win is you run to the middle. And this is no longer an abstract theory. We have now beta tested this theory. <laughs> and every time we follow that advice, we get clobbered. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is very simple. If you compare 2004, the last race we won nationally, to 2008 and 12, the biggest difference is the millions upon millions of conservative voters who showed up in 04, who stayed home in 08, and stayed home in bigger numbers in 12. And I believe if we're going to win, the central question in this general election is how do you motivate and inspire and bring back to the polls the 54 million evangelical Christians who stayed home in 2012? How do you motivate and bring back to the polls the Reagan Democrats, the blue collar Catholics across the Midwest and up into New England who stayed home in the polls? And the one thing that is abundantly clear is if we nominate another candidate, 
in the mold of a Bob Dole or a John McCain or a Mitt Romney, all of whom are good, honorable, decent men who love this country, but what they did didn't work. And if we do it again, the same millions of voters who stayed home in 08 and 12 will stay home in 16 and Hillary becomes the next president. So how do we win? If you look since World War, since World War II, the only Republicans who have ever won have, won on, have run on all three legs of the conservative stool. They have run as fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, and national security conservatives. If you chop off one of those legs, we don't get to 51%. And so the trick is to speak in a way that energizes. So for example, you asked about the question of life. I'll tell you the context in which I most like to discuss life, and that is the Little Sisters of the Poor. The Little Sisters of the Poor are a Catholic charity of nuns who've taken vows of poverty. They spend their lives caring for the poor and elderly, and right now the Obama administration is litigating against the Little Sisters of the Poor, trying to force the nuns to pay for abortion-inducing drugs and others. Now, I've joked many times, a really good rule of thumb if you're litigating against nuns, <laughs> you've probably done something wrong. <laughs> if we focus on values that unify us, that bring us together, bringing back jobs and growth and opportunity, defending our constitutional rights, and restoring America's leadership in the world, that in 1980, is how the Reagan revolution rose up. It's what brought millions of people to the polls who had never voted again, and it's what we're seeing happening now. There is a reason why in six months, we've had over 500,000 contributions at tedcruz.org. Our average contribution is $63. There is a reason why when we do rallies, a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, we were in Kalamazoo, Michigan, 9 a.m. on a Monday morning in a hockey rink. 800 people came out, almost all Reagan Democrats. Irish Catholic Union members, working men and women, the people getting hammered by the Obama economy. If we're going to win, we run a populist campaign of hardworking men and women who want to believe again in the promise of America, and we run it against the bipartisan corruption of Washington that Hillary Clinton embodies. And let me say one final thing, Matt, which is I cannot wait to stand on a debate stage with Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Reagan understood that you win elections by making choices that are meaningful choices. You don't blur the difference. There's a reason there's only one Republican in the last 50 years who has a group of Democrats named after him. Reagan Democrats. We need to nominate a candidate who has the clarity to stand up and say, if you vote for Hillary Clinton, you are voting for the Ayatollah Khamenei to have nuclear weapons. And if you vote for me, Iran will never have nuclear weapons. And if you vote for Hillary Clinton, you are voting for 12 million people who are here illegally to be granted amnesty. If you vote for me, we will secure the border and stop illegal immigration. If you vote for Hillary, you are voting for Obamacare to be a permanent feature of our economy in perpetuity. If you vote for me, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. That, I believe, is how we win with a cheerful, clear, meaningful distinction that makes a difference to working men and women across this country. Right. Thank you, Senator.